On October 25th, 1918, Fanny Jacobs and Harold Rosenberg were married in front of a thousand people in Philadelphia. It was a notable wedding for several reasons. Fanny and Harold had never met before the ceremony. The wedding took place under a black chuppah in a cemetery, and all around them raged what would later be known as the Great Influenza Pandemic. In Yiddish, this event is referred to as a Schwarze Kasana, a black wedding. Born of superstition in Eastern Europe, it was thought that to marry two individuals who might not otherwise be able to marry because they were poor or sick or orphaned, this would divert God's attention and avert the plague. It was hoped the great mitzvah of providing for an unlikely couple and celebrating a new union while acknowledging the death toll would halt the spread of disease. Black weddings were used all over Europe in the last 100 years as a response to disaster in Jewish communities. Cholera outbreaks, plagues of locusts, typhus epidemics, all were reasons to raise a black chuppah and try to invoke God's mercy. It may sound crazy to us now, but considering no one 100 years ago knew what caused disease, how to stop its spread, or how to cure it, how could a wedding in a cemetery be the wrong remedy? <laughs> After all, the first drafts of history being written now say that we, the community of 2020, responded in part to COVID-19 by stockpiling toilet paper. <laughs> For two and a half years, COVID has battered the world. The angel of death came for millions, causing unspeakable pain and suffering as families and communities were ripped apart. Who among us did not lose someone? Many of those who had it early and survived suffer long-term symptoms. Gross deficiencies in our systems were laid bare not knowing when or if it will truly ever be over has triggered long-term chronic stress, depression, and anxiety in our general population. This would be enough to bring any society to its knees and any individual to breaking point. But since March of 2020, we have also witnessed ongoing waves of civil unrest in response to racial and policing issues, the turbulence, that we saw in response to the murder of George Floyd and others to follow was the greatest we've experienced since perhaps the civil rights era. And if that weren't enough, since March of 2020, we have lived through 1,728 mass shootings. 1,728. We have never seen gun violence on this scale. And if that weren't enough, our political system has become unglued. The polarization of American society has left some, loosely speaking, of another civil war. Baby boomers say they can't remember such a time of division and anger in our country since perhaps the Vietnam War. Now add a brutal war in Ukraine, instability of the financial markets, and the Supreme Court's decision to reverse past precedents in gun reform, campaign financing, and years of hard-won abortion rights. These two and a half years have been a crucible, testing us by fire. These are truly extraordinary times. I would officiate a hundred weddings in a cemetery if I thought it would help. <laughs> The Psalms say that joy comes in the morning. But what happens when life feels like an endless night? We have endured a prolonged state of anxiety and unease. We've suffered immeasurable heartbreak and felt real hopelessness. When the outside landscape is grim, our inner lives often mirror that darkness. So many of us lost our equilibrium during this time, all of us lost any sense of life's controllability or predictability. People often asked me how the community here at Central was holding up. We were still working, and I'd say, 
you know, we're okay. We're Jews. Jews are built for crisis. We're no strangers to disease. The Torah is filled with instruction on quarantining and communal safety in the times of illness. We have suffered the pain of being a minority too and have been treated like second-class citizens so many times in our history. We have witnessed political upheaval so threatening that the Jews were expelled from their homelands or locked in ghettos or worse. Ancient Israel knew and modern Israel knows war very well. Unfortunately, we are built for crisis. And as a result, the Jewish narrative is one of resilience, a trait most people and communities need to hone. Resilience is an old, dependable friend of the Jews. Because of our historical cycle of trauma and renewal, it is just an inherent characteristic we possess. Think of resilience as part of the Jewish DNA. This collective memory can guide us in our time of compound crisis. We can be strengthened by our communal and our individual history. We can double down on what's important to us and reconsider the rest. There are countless examples in Jewish history where catastrophe and hard times did not spell the end. When our ancient temples in Jerusalem, the center of Jewish civilization, were destroyed, our ancestors prevailed. They redefined Judaism to focus on individual uh, synagogues and home observance. After expulsion from Spain, the Sephardic Jews were able to maintain their identity and culture. They established communities all over the world and widespread European anti-Semitism gave way to a nationalist movement that would secure a Jewish home after 2,000 years without one. We are a people who rebuild, refocus, redesign, redistribute, regroup. Whatever needs to be done to survive and then sustain, we do it. What we currently have on our plate cannot be minimized but it's not more than our ancestors ever had. Becoming a student of Jewish history is not just about knowing that we as a people have always persevered, although that's very helpful for perspective. It is about knowing where we individually come from. A study conducted at Emory University involved identifying indicators for resilience in children. And the psychologists found that the more kids knew about their family history, the more they had a sense of control over their lives and higher self-esteem. The conclusions had to do with the children's sense of being part of something larger than themselves. They learned from the narratives of their family, and we can too. There was a woman in her mid-20s that got divorced when all her friends were getting married, and it sparked a period of isolation for her such as she had never known. And a few months later, she lost her younger brother, age 23, suddenly and tragically. The grief for her was profound. And a few months after that, she lost her grandmother, a guiding light in her life. Three life-changing losses in 12 months. Now, I know that story very well because that woman was me 20 years ago. Even though the Latin source of the word resilience means to bounce back, I did not bounce right back to my old life. Stress and grief changed me so deeply. Finding my footing wasn't about overcoming those losses. It was about becoming someone new, and I was able to do it in part by embracing my Jewish narrative, by remembering who and what came before me. I moved to Israel right after these traumas for my fourth year of graduate school. Knowing that my ancestors had walked out of years of slavery in Egypt to arrive on that same soil meant something to me. Knowing that even more recent relatives had escaped Hitler to arrive in Israel meant something to me. Knowing how Israelis had suffered, how they fought, how loss was a daily part of life there, all of it gave me strength. These ghosts of history kept me company. As I visited with my ancestors, long gone, I realized that my descendants too 
would be in Israel one day. Like the kids in that study, I saw myself as something much greater. And yet, grief is so personal. My brother and my grandmother, both gone from this world, sat with me in my tiny Jerusalem apartment, and they helped me find the fortitude to face my future. Reports from concentration camps all over Europe revealed that prisoners who were too weak to walk or even stand were immediately shot dead if they fell to the ground. And the people were said then to put their weakest in the middle of the group, pressing against them to hold them up. The weak of the community were carried in the middle until they were ready to walk again on their own. I was put in the middle that year by my fellow classmates. I was not living through anything close to a death camp. There's no comparison. But they held me up all the same, and I saw that resilience can grow by receiving the help and the kindness that others will give to you. I learned that in Judaism, the entire community is responsible for the one who suffers. I don't share my story with you to say, I did it and so can you, but I point out that everyone's life has sorrow and everyone's life has suffering and loss. And if we realize that we aren't the first to really agonize and we will not be the last, then a reason can be found for putting one foot in front of the other. I want to share a story with you from our Center for Exploring Judaism, which I've directed here at Central for close to 13 years. With permission, I share that one of our students, Aaron, age 42, was diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor two months into our class together. He had a wife, Ashley, and a young son, Jack. Through the teaching of Jewish values and caring for the sick and carrying the weak, the class understood this family was our responsibility and how they stepped up. They sent challah every week, holiday meals and toys for Jack. A nanny in our class babysat. Other classmates drove Aaron to treatments and visited him while in the hospital. A couple nearby walked their dog. Another student, a home health aide in our class, moved in with this family to lighten Ashley's load. And ultimately, many of them attended Aaron's funeral two months ago, and we grieved together. The class found resilience in each other, and sometimes that is as good as it gets. Judaism does not have an explanation for why a 42-year-old man would be taken from his family and this world, but our actions embodied our response. There is power and comfort in community. We walked together in the valley of the shadow of death, and now we try to walk Ashley and Jack back into the sun after an inconceivable loss. Being part of community is key to weathering misfortune and tragedy when it arrives. I always tell my students, we cannot be Jewish alone, and so too we cannot carry the burden of this past two and a half years by ourselves. Many of us found that our community, beginning with our families, was so much more important than we thought. Going forward, many will never have a Passover Seder without a Zoom option to include faraway relatives. Many will now always make one night of the seven for Shiva virtual for the same reasons. So many people befriended their neighbors for the first time in their lives, recognizing the gift of micro-community. While our country may feel as divided as it has in our lifetimes, family and communal bonds are stronger than ever. How many of us found new hobbies during this time, new interests, new ways to connect with the simple things that were right in front of us? We can continue to do this. We don't have to go back to the exact lives we led. The world changes after every period of crisis, and we can too. Consider these examples of a world transformed. In the 18th century, when the Jews of Europe were emancipated as a result of the Age of Enlightenment, the community experienced a massive crisis of identity. 
Susanna Heschel writes that this ferment sparked tremendous cultural creativity, itself a vibrant expression of resilience. Witness Spinoza's philosophy, Marx's political theory, Freud's psychiatry, Durkheim's sociology, Einstein's physics, Schoenberg's compositions, I could go on and on. After World War I and the Spanish flu of 1918, there was a change in the way people assembled. The years following showed a new interest in social interactions. The 1920s saw a rise of jazz clubs, organized athletics, fraternal organizations, and of course, the golden age of cinema. As the current pandemic subsides, we already see more outdoor events and activity options, and of course, an entire virtual world of programming. Rosh Hashanah is always a wake-up call because it's a marker in time. One year ends, one year begins. But this year, and these past two and a half years, the universe has sent us a wake-up call as well, and we'd be wise not to hit the snooze button. The imagery of the liturgy is about God as the great editor of the Book of Life. But if we think about our own personal book, many pages may not feel appropriate after this trying time. We can edit them or cut them out. They should reflect what we've learned, how we've grown, what if not these past, wor these past years have convinced us time waits for no one? And who, if not us, the survivors, can write a new chapter as we decide exactly how we want to move ahead? No one can say when or if COVID will truly be over. It could be with us in some form for many generations. We have already learned to coexist with so many new realities. Our lives have been turned upside down and inside out by illness, loss, civil unrest, gun violence, and a world at war on multiple fronts. Everything looks different. But even as we sort all this out and we realign our realities and expectations, it's interesting to note what return to our community first. Weddings, not black ones, white ones, not fearful, joyous. Whether a cautious meeting between two people and their rabbi, or a family of six on a patio, or a backyard wedding for 50 with a Zoom set up, weddings returned. We officiated so many of them in this last year. I can tell you there is nothing more hopeful. A wedding is the start of a new life, a new journey, a leap of faith that the future will be bright. Armed with that hope, and strengthened by our ancestral, familial, and individual resilience, we can scan our horizons for new commitments, a new goal, a new job, a new interest, a new friend. 5783 can be just the right time in human history for a new age of enlightenment. Energized by what we've come through, it can be a time for generations to join together, to fight for justice for all people, and refuse to accept ill will toward one another and do what we are called upon as Jews to do. Tikkun olam, repair of the world, is among our highest imperatives. In doing so and with these efforts, we can add pages to our own book of life as we strive to earn God's blessings and spread them as far as we can. Thank you and Shana Tovah. <laughs>